Thank you all for that wonderful music. Let's just thank the Lord right now. Would you do that with me? Thank Him. Praise Him. Got a couple other things I want to share with you today. Um, this past Friday, uh, the church staff got together and we honored uh, one of our own. Um, many of you know that uh, Vicki Taylor has been uh, really the pastor's secretary, the pastor's assistant here for many years, but her history with Broadway goes way beyond that. I think she started in the early days in the Broadway nursery and she worked for North Point for a while and then transferred from North Point back to the church. And as best we can tell, uh, Vicki has faithfully served over 37 years of her life right here at Broadway Baptist Church. Can you thank the Lord for her service? And uh, she officially retired uh, at the end of last month. And so we, we had a sweet, sweet uh, retirement party for Vicki. And uh, she did not want to be uh, made to come up before the church. She's very much a behind the scenes type of person. But I, I want you to encourage her and thank her when you see her because she has served faithfully for 37 years plus. And then I wanted you to know that as of November the 1st, John McEwen went from part-time status to full-time status. He's now our full-time children's pastor. Would you thank the Lord for John? And we're excited about that, amen? And uh, he's not in here because he's doing what he needs to be doing right now. So it was one of those bittersweet uh, weeks in the life of our church where we said so long and farewell to one employee. She's still going to serve here, and, and Ken teaches a class. And, uh, but, but John, will he's already taken on the mantle of full-time service to the church. And I'm so grateful for both of them. While the instruments were playing, I thought of that little quote that many of you are familiar with. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And where the blood flows, the church grows. Uh, most of us in this room, perhaps all of us, will never truly be able to grasp or fully appreciate the extent, uh, the degree to which some people actually suffer for simply loving Christ. But I hope you'll let that video today be a very real reminder of our responsibility to pray and that uh, you'll go online. You can, there's so many things. Just type in the persecuted church and you'll, you'll receive some things that you can pray for. I think there may be a web page on the cover of our bulletin, but uh, I encourage you to take that and, and run with it. Uh, we have brothers and sisters around the globe who would agree with this statement. Life is hard. But it's not just hard in foreign countries. Life even here in the United States, in its own way, can be very, very difficult. In fact, uh, I don't think anybody would argue with that. And I want you to think about some of the obvious areas where we have daily struggles. Uh, what about health? I've, I've already talked to a few people this morning, uh, gotten an update on some parents, and uh, got an update on someone that's facing a procedure this week. But our health can be a real issue. Either we're struggling or someone we love is struggling with sickness or some long-term uh, disease that is disabling. What about job problems? Sometimes we, we face things at work. Again, I spoke to someone as recent as this morning who faces just some really unique challenges, problems at work. And I mean, all of us face some kind of issue wherever we might land in terms of our vocation. What about raising children? Um, there's all kinds of stress related to raising our children. Now, there's lots of fun, there's tremendous joy, but there can be tremendous stress uh, when things aren't going right in their lives, whether physically or educationally or relationally. And some of us think, man, I just think I just can't wait till I reach that point when, when the kids finally grow up and they, and they move out. But the problem is when they grow up and move out, they're still your children, and, and your role as a parent really never ends. In fact, the problems become a lot more intense as they grow and mature. What about betrayal? All of us probably in this room have had friends that have just betrayed us. 
In some cases, we've had a spouse that has deserted us. It's heartbreaking. And what about the problem of money? I was reading an article this week about uh, some people that have the problem of having too much money. I, I had to roll that one around for a little while. And I thought, I don't know that I associate with too many people that have the problem of too much money. But, but money or the lack thereof, can be a real issue in some people's lives. I've read for years, and I think I've seen it play out, that the number one cause of marital discourse, in most cases, is money. It's money-related. Life can be hard. Our struggles are not all the same because we have a wise Heavenly Father who sovereignly fits the trial to the person. And I believe the Apostle James would agree with this statement. In a sense, the entire book of James is about how to respond properly when we're under pressure. And that's why I want to speak today on what to remember when life is tough. Open your Bible to the book of James, James chapter 1. James' entire letter is really about how to respond properly when we're dealing with the tough stuff in life. In the first couple of verses in chapter 1, he tells us that trials are necessary and, and they're an integral part to our spiritual growth. In other words, without pressure, without trial, without test, there's no real growth. And then in verse 12, he lets us know that there's a blessing that's been reserved for those of us who are able to respond to those trials rightly. And then we're also encouraged in the last verses not to blame God when, when hard times come. This morning, I just want to zero in on verse 16 through 18 in James 1. James 1, verse 16 through 18 where, where James moves in this very familiar line of argument by reminding us that, that God is actually good all the time, even when life is throwing its worst at us. That God is good all the time, even during the most difficult trials. We could say it this way, God is not on trial during our trials. We're the ones who are on trial God uses hard times to refine our faith. He, he uses the tests and the pressures to squeeze us and, and mold us and shape us more and more that we might reflect Jesus. And so in this passage, uh, James gives us three things that we really need to remember if we're going to benefit from the test that we may be in or the test that's waiting for us around the corner. The first thing he reminds us of is this. When, when life is tough and when life is really throwing some very, very difficult things at you, we, we've got to remember God's love. We've got to remember God's love. When life is tough, we've just got to tell ourselves over and over, He still loves me. He, he hasn't left me. He won't abandon me. And, and this tragedy, this trial, this test that I'm going through does not mean that God doesn't love me. Just the opposite. We need to remember His love. Look at verse 16. He, he writes, Don't be deceived, my beloved brothers. Wow, I like that. So when hard times come, I think sometimes it's easy to blame God for all the inconvenience and junk that we may be going through. And we're tempted to say, what's up with this? Like Adam and Eve in the garden, we've really learned how to pass the buck. We say stuff like, it's not my fault. I didn't deserve this. You started it. The devil made me do it. I couldn't control myself. I... I just think you've had it in for me, or the whole thing was rigged. We've heard that kind of language. I've had a string of bad luck. Or, or if I was older, or younger, richer, smarter, single, married, or better educated, or better connected, none of this would be happening, me, happening to me. But in the end, all of our flimsy excuses lead us right back to God. God made us. God gave us life, and one day we'll give an account to the Lord Almighty. All of our excuses will be exposed as lies when we stand in the blinding light of God's holy presence. So, so don't deceive yourself into thinking that you can blame God 
for the trials or even the temptations that you face. That's really one of the first things that James wants us to see in his brief letter. But then he adds this important truth when he calls his readers, my beloved brothers. It's really not just a term of affection. In reality, James wouldn't know everybody he was even writing to. The church had been scattered, scattered. They were all over. They were in many places. It's not like he's saying, hey, I love you guys, and and no doubt that would be true, but the phrase, my beloved brothers, means a whole lot more than, hey, I love you. In fact, James is actually reminding his readers that they were greatly loved by God. He was reminding them that they were brothers and sisters in Christ who had experienced the love of God in a very familiar way. He was really saying, look, when when you are tempted to give up, when you're feeling pressured, when, when you're feeling forgotten, when you're tempted to just throw in the towel, remember, re- remember how much God loves you. H.B. Charles Jr. says it this way, The danger of the unredeemed sinner is unbelief. But the danger, the peril of, of the believer, the redeemed sinner, is misbelief. We, we misbelieve when we forget what it cost God to save us. We misbelieve when we forget the pit from which we have been rescued. We misbelieve when we accuse God of mistreating us. That's misbelief. We say, what's the cure for misbelief? There is no cure for misbelief other than the truth of God's Word. We must combat the lies that the enemy wants us to believe with the truth of God's wonderful Word. I read about a woman recently who came to Christ from a background of really just complete dysfunction, complete brokenness, a a life that included almost every sin you could think of. I mean, just a horrible life. She started attending a little church. Every time she went, she said, I had no problem when I went in through the doors of the church realizing that I was a sinner. It seemed like everything in me just cried out, man, I am a terrible person, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner. In an email she wrote to her pastor, she listed many of her sins. Then she said this, One night, I was driving home in rush hour traffic on the freeway listening to a Christian radio station. I can't tell you exactly who was speaking, but somebody was talking about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And then she says, "I, I, I didn't know what happened. I started crying and saying something like, Oh, Jesus, please forgive me for sinning against you. I'm so sorry. I mean, after all you did for me, look at what I've done to you. I know who you are now. And she writes, The feeling in that car was overwhelming. I didn't know what was going on then, but I know now the Holy Spirit swooped down on me and He called me to Jesus and I came. Wow, I love that statement. The Holy Spirit swooped down on me. Many of us have experienced that wonderful calling of God. And, and we listen, she says, He called me and I came. Isn't it something, she writes, that the most incredible experience of my life happened during rush hour traffic on a cold night in November in a car. Not a church pew, but in rush hour traffic. She writes, I left home that morning and came back that night a completely different woman. And then she writes to quote my favorite gospel song, which seems so appropriate, and which in one sentence sums up what has happened to me since I came to Jesus. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind but now I see. Here's how she signed her note. Lingering at the foot of the cross. That gets me. Lingering at the foot of the cross. And I thought that's exactly where we all should be all the time because the longer we linger at the foot of the cross, remembering what Christ did for us, we're not likely to be deceived when tough times come, and they will come. You may be there today. 
You may be facing something that feels like the weight of the world. You may feel like you have no one you can trust any longer. Remember this. God loves you, and He demonstrated that tremendous love by giving His only begotten Son to die on the cross for your sins and my sins. And and when you feel pressed and lonely and weak and you're ready to give up, remember, God really loves you. Francis Chan calls it crazy love. God really loves you. Secondly, when life gets hard, we should really recall God's goodness. We should recall His goodness. Look at verse 17. James says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variation or shadow due to change. Now, the change in subject seems a little abrupt, but the flow of his thought is very, very clear. And he's saying we can't blame God when temptation comes into our life because evil desire leads to sin, and that leads to death. It's found in verse 13 through 15. Let me read it for you. James says, when we're tempted, nobody should ever say, God is tempting me. For God can't be tempted by evil, nor does He tempt anyone. But every person is tempted when they're dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Verse 15, and then, after desire has conceived, well, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. And so we're being reminded that evil desires, lust, leads to death. Twice. James warned us not to blame God for our problems. He says when we sin, we only have ourselves to blame. Verse 17 sets up a beautiful contrast when he says, everything good in this world ultimately comes from God. In other words, if it's good, God made it, God gave it, or God sent it. Amen? The familiar words of our doxology express this so beautifully when when the hymn writer says, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. If it's good, it's from God. He either made it, gave it, sent it, but, but thank God from whom all blessings flow. I wonder sometimes if we really believe that. You know how we greet people and people give us these really brief answers that we really expect. And truth be told, when we say to someone, hey, how are you doing? Now, we're just being honest, right? We're in church. We don't expect somebody to say, hey, I'd love to sit down with you for the next 45 minutes and really tell you. Uh, uh, No, not really. No, we say stuff like, well, I'm doing great. And we we just sort of buzz past each other. I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. I asked some guy recently, I said, how you doing, man? He goes, well, I'm still, still taking nourishment. It was kind of funny, and I knew what he was saying, but it was just his spin, his, sort of his North Mississippi spin on, I'm fine. He said, well, I'm, I'm still taking nourishment, which means I'm doing okay. But do we really realize that in him, that is in God, we live and move and have our Being, I mean, listen, we breathe because God gives us air to breathe. Amen? God gives us lungs to take it in. If God withdrew His hand of blessing, do you understand that not one of us would be able to take another breath? We see, we hear, we move, we think, we laugh, clap, dream, cry, all because God has given us the ability to live. And I think we all know that, but... We don't think about it enough, and and we don't stop and give thanks frequently enough for the blessing of life. The list of sick people and suffering people seems to have no end. Uh, I got word this morning, again, a precious friend in our congregation, and the request was simple. Hey, would you pray for me over the next couple of days? Sure. How can I pray for you? My best friend passed away. My best friend passed away. Death comes to all of us sooner or later. Let me just say this. If you're alive this morning, some of you may not feel like you have anything to praise God for, but if you're here and and you're alive and you're breathing, you're taking up space, 
Do you realize you can say, oh God, today thank you for the gift of life. We really ought to ponder Paul's question in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, where he asks, what do you have that you didn't receive? What do you have that you didn't receive? You ever catch yourself bragging about your wealth or your position? Maybe boasting about your talent or your accomplishments? Well, let me ask you a few questions. Who gave you that talent? Who gave you that strength? Who gave you that creativity or that ingenuity? Who gave you all those blessings that we seem to take for granted? Well, the answer is obvious. God did. God did. He's the author and giver of all the good things in our lives. James emphasizes this when he says that every good gift comes down from the Father of lights. Maybe you've heard the phrase, the quality of mercy is not strained. It drops as the gentle rain from heaven. And those famous lines are true in every way possible. I mean, mercy always comes down. It starts with God and moves to man begins in heaven, and it ends up on earth. See, you and I never have the privilege of bargaining with God because to bargain, you've got to have something to bargain with, and we don't bring anything to the table. We have nothing to offer God except the broken, shattered pieces of our lives. And last time I checked, that's not a very good bargaining tool. No, mercy is like the gentle rain that comes and softens the hard soil of the human heart. And we need this because all of us are worse sinners than we're really willing to admit. Even the best Christian would have no hope of heaven without what I call the abounding, overwhelming mercy of God. See, if God didn't forgive and keep on forgiving, if He didn't continue to pour out His mercy like the gentle rain from heaven we would be utterly and completely lost. This, tomorrow morning I'll be speaking to about 90 uh, college graduates, young men and women at the Kanakuk Bible Institute. And most of the talk is going to be what God's been teaching me and my family through our time of grief. Um, and part of what I want to say to them is that one of the things that has sustained me and Lisa and Beth Ann and Shirley has been just coming back to the things we're certain of and, and reminding ourselves of who God is. Let me ask you something. What kind of God do we serve? Well, He's completely good according to the Scripture. And He's constantly good, and He's unchangeably good. And God will never not be good. God will never be less than good. Everything God does, according to the Scripture, is good. And we know the phrase, God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good, no matter what, He's good. And I like to say, on your worst day, on my worst day, God is still good. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. See what God's done. Part of us have the problem of being just forgetful and short-sighted, and so did the children of Israel, and so do modern-day saints. And so the Scripture repeatedly calls us, remember, 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 remember. When the Lord was getting ready to leave this planet, He instituted the Lord's Supper, and the whole purpose of the Supper is to remember Remember, I read a story this week about a, a son who takes care of his aging mother. She's been going through different stages of dementia. And she was a real woman of faith and a real woman who had a bold, I mean, really just loved Jesus, served Jesus. And as she has grown older and, and as the dementia has taken more and more of her mind, uh, she can't really remember much. And the dementia has actually impaired her physical movement, and, and now she, she walks with a walker. And the son was saying he noticed one day as he was visiting her, uh, she was making it from one end of the, a small room to the other end, and with each step she said, Help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. And he said, Initially I thought that was so, so sad. And he said, 
the moment I felt that, instantly the Spirit of God reminded me, don't you be sad about your mother saying, help me Jesus, help me Jesus, help me Jesus. See, the truth is all of us are impaired. He said that day as I watched my aging mother barely get across the room, but each step depending on Jesus, help me Jesus, help me Jesus, I was reminded that that's exactly where God wants me to live. That every moment of my life, He wants me to be 100% dependent on Him. See, our problem is we think we got it going on until till something big hits. The problem is we have forgotten how great God is and how needy we are. If God stopped caring, if God stopped loving if God stopped being the sovereign Lord, we couldn't even take the next breath. So I pray that all of us would realize that life can turn on a dime. No one, not one of us in this room knows what a day may bring. It's a fact. Life is never just one thing. It's always good and bad, sickness and health. It's always reaping, uh, excuse me, weeping and rejoicing. It's always life and death, always war and peace, all mixed in together. That's why we need a God with whom there's no shadow of turning. Our God, according to James, is the still point in our changing world. God is not good today and bad tomorrow. God doesn't carelessly change his mind and decide, well, I'll be kind today, but harsh tomorrow. We're like that, but God is not. So when you're tempted to give up, remember the goodness of God. When you feel like just giving in to temptation, you better remember God is good. And when you want to resign from life, please recall the goodness of God. There's a third thing James tells us to remember. It's found in verse 18. We, we should remember God's grace. God's grace. He writes, of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. It's a beautiful statement. As James thinks of the goodness of God, he naturally turns to an illustration that all of his first century readers would understand. It's the phrase, brought us forth. Now, in the original language, that word means to simply give birth. To give birth. What do we know about this divine birth? Well, James says God saved us of His own will. See, whatever else you and I might want to say about free will, we need to be very clear on this. Salvation does not begin with us. Salvation always starts with God. Amen? The, the Holy Spirit must swoop down and speak to us and call us. And, and so when He calls, he, he gives us the grace to answer. Salvation was never I, my idea, never your idea. Salvation never began in my heart and somehow worked its way to God. Salvation always begins with God and finds its way to my heart. I'm reminded of the teenage guy that got radically saved and he stood up in a midweek pr prayer service to share his testimony. And, and after he shared at the end of the service an old guy went up to him and he meant to encourage him but he also wanted to admonish him just a bit and he said young man what you shared tonight was great but you didn't share a thing about your part in your salvation and the young man replied oh i'm sorry my part in salvation was to run from the lord as fast as i could and god's part was to pursue me until he found me and saved me by his grace amen what was he saying? I don't have a part. Salvation is all God, all God. I want you to hear me when I say this. Salvation is of the Lord. And I know we say stuff like, I found the Lord, and that's true. It's perfectly acceptable language. But here's what I want you to hear me say. If the Lord didn't find us first, we'd never find Him. Why do we need new life? Well, the answer is pretty straightforward. We, we need new life because the old life we were born with is filled with sin and disobedience. 
James has just said in verse 14 and 15, lust leads to sin and sin leads to death. One of our deacons brought into the deacons meeting one of Warren Wiersbe's B-series books and it just reminded me of what an intelligent and faithful and godly man Warren Wiersbe is. And Wiersbe says, by granting us a new birth, God is declaring He cannot and will not accept the old birth. God rejects your first birth, no matter how noble it might be, in the eyes of men. And He announces that you and I need a second birth. And that's why Jesus said, you must be born again. It's a spiritual rebirth. And that kind of new birth is not an option, my friends, if you really, really want to go to heaven. Even the best among us need to be saved, need to be born again. It's a gift of God given by grace and received by faith. That's why we're committed to preaching the Word of God and nothing else in this church. It's not our words that bring life. And I could tell you that I could preach until I'm blue in the face, but my words will never give anyone life. You know why? My words are human words. And, and because of that, they're limited. My, my words may amuse at times, uh, bring some comfort, make people angry or even embitter others. Uh, my words might instruct and even challenge, but my words in and of themselves have really nothing to offer in terms of life. But the Word of God is completely different. You say, why? Well, because the Scripture tells us that the Word of God comes from God. It has ultimate authority, and because it's true, it is 100% reliable. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says that the Word of God is alive and active. It is a sword that lays bare the hidden secrets of our hearts. I'm telling you that when we preach the Word of God in the power of the Holy Spirit, it penetrates every heart, it reveals every sin, exposes every excuse and shows us our need, and then it leads us to the cross of Jesus Christ where we can be wonderfully, in fact, gloriously forgiven. The Jewish readers were very familiar with this concept of first fruits that James talks about in this passage. Each year, the early part of the harvest was set aside for the Lord as a testimony that the Lord owned everything. The entire harvest belonged to Him. Now, that means to refer to us as first fruits. James is saying we're a sign to the world that a great harvest is underway and that God intends to use us to display His grace and His love to the entire world. We are, in fact, God wants us to be exhibit A of what He can do in broken, fallible, limited people. You might go so far as to say our job is to be fallible and broken, and we've got that part down. But God's job is to show His grace through people like us. And He's at the job and on the job 24-7. See, that puts our trials, our tests, our tough times in a whole new perspective. Recently I came across this quote and it really arrested my attention. Here's what it says, when all is finished, you'll discover it was never random. When all is finished, you will discover it's never been random. It, it seems random at the moment, and because it seems random, you can be sure that everything is not finished. In fact, we're never really finished in this life because God always has more work to be done in us and through us. Let me wrap it up and remind you of some things. Things that you know and things that I know. First of all, it's not about me. It's always about God. It's not about now. The Christian life is about eternity. And very often the here and now will never make sense to us can I get an amen on that? Look, look, I'm just telling you, there's some things that you are experiencing right now or you may experience that will never make sense to you in the here and now. And I don't have some formula to give you that can dispel all your fears or clear away all your confusion or wipe away your tears. We're reminded that, well, 
into everyone's life, some rain must fall. And just like this morning, sometimes it's a sprinkle, sometimes it pours, but watch out, sometimes it's an absolute flood and it threatens to overwhelm us. Said another way, if you ever get to the place in your life where all your questions are answered, all your problems are gone, all your trials, all your tests have, have vanished, well, sit back, man, and relax. You know why? You're in heaven. Between now and then, there will be danger, toils, and snares. Always. In this life, Jesus said, you will have trouble. That means none of us are exempt. But the grace that has taken us this far will lead us safely home. When life's tough, remember God's love. Recall God's goodness. And third, remember His grace. Amazing grace. The grace that saved you the grace that sustains you, and the grace that will enable you to die well. A good memory of the right things will keep you strong when tough times hit. And they will hit. It's never a question of if. It's always a matter of when. Remember God's love. Recall His goodness. Remember His grace. Let's bow for prayer. Lord, You could not be more clear in Your Word that in this life there's going to be problems, there's going to be difficulties, there's going to be trouble, tests. And I thank You so much for the Word in James chapter 1. That, that when that hits, Lord, when, when the tough times come, you call us to remember your love, your goodness, and your grace. Oh, God, thank you for loving us so much that you gave your only begotten Son on the cross to become our substitute, to pay our sin debt. Uh, Lord, without that gift, none of us would be here this morning. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you that everything good in our lives is from you. You are the God from whom all good, wonderful blessings flow. And really, that prompts our hearts today to love you in a fresh way, to adore you, and to yield our lives to you. And then, Lord, you call us to remember grace that we've been saved by grace, not by works. Nobody in this room could ever achieve or accomplish anything that would be acceptable to you. Thank you that we've been saved by grace and that we received the gift through faith, simple childlike faith in your Son, our Savior. Oh God, I pray if there's anybody in this room like that precious woman that I read about earlier that was saved during rush hour traffic. I pray if there's even one individual in this room that's never experienced your grace and received you by faith that today might be the day where you overwhelm them and draw them to yourself. And as you call them, I pray they'll come and surrender the broken, shattered pieces of their lives to you and in doing so get to know you as their heavenly father there's some people here today who are about ready to throw in the towel a test a trial they've been betrayed they've been let down they feel forgotten they feel forsaken oh god i pray that if there's anybody in this place struggling like that 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 they would experience in a very real way the truth that you proclaimed, that you will never leave us, that you will never forsake us. The truth is we're never really alone because you are ever present. Thank you, Lord, for who you are and for how you love. And I pray this entire month you would wake us up spiritually that we might be men and women and young people who give thanks. Give thanks 
with a willing, adoring heart. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the one who was slain for our sins to receive glory and honor and power and strength. Remind us, O God, that you are worthy. In your name and in faith, we pray. Amen. Look this way. Stand up, please. So if you've never given your life to the Lord Jesus, I can't think of a better time than right now. The staff are here and it'd be our joy, it'd be our privilege, it'd be our honor to pray with you and show you through the scriptures how you can have a life-changing encounter with Christ today, this morning. You can leave completely different in Christ. Maybe you're here and you're just one of those people I've described. You're just living life. And life has been dishing out to you an extra helping and perhaps a heaping helping of trouble, despair, discouragement, doubt, a storm that you never asked for, something you just could not foresee. And, you know, you're just being honest and saying, man, this is the toughest season of my life. Well, it'd be our joy to pray with you and to love you and encourage you. Please, don't resist that kind of love. Don't resist that kind of ministry. We, we would love to pour into you the love of God. Maybe you're here and you need a church. I tell people all the time, Broadway Church is so far from perfect. It's filled with a bunch of redeemed sinners. But I'll tell you this much, Jesus never fails. And you can count on him. And we count this as one of our serious responsibilities to offer you not just our lives, not just our friendship, but a relationship with God the Father through Christ His Son, and that we might experience Him through the indwelling Holy Spirit. We're going to preach the Bible. We're going to lift up Jesus. If you need a faith family, well, we invite you to come, and we'd love to tell you how that can happen. Brandon's going to sing, and just use the next few moments to respond back to God. His Word is what He's saying to you. Respond back to Him right now with a heart of humility and a heart of faith. In Jesus' name, say yes to Him today as Brandon sings.